Thank you for tuning into White Centipede Noise Podcast. Please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. This podcast is made possible by viewer and listener support. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider supporting it at patreon.com slash white centipede noise. White Centipede Noise is a label and mail order based in Germany, releasing top quality noise on tape, CD, and vinyl. White Centipede Noise is also the premier EU-based distributor of international noise. Visit whitecentipedenoise.com to see available label releases and weekly distro updates. To White Centipede Noise podcast. My name is Oscar Brummel, and today my guest is a titan of the Vancouver harsh noise scene. Please welcome Kate Rissick of Rasulka. Kate, did I pronounce your name right? Yes. Good job. Okay. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh, thanks. Um, yeah. Good morning. Thanks for uh, thanks for being with me. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think right, right away, I'd like to jump into a bit of your history, um, as, uh, as an, as a, as a noise musician and as an artist, um, can you give me a little bit about the history, the background of, uh, Rusalka, when that started and what prompted you to start this project? Yeah. So I started in about 2006, 2007, and I jumped in pretty fast to performing live. There was a lot going on in Vancouver and right. in the surrounding areas. And uh, I wasn't so much into recording. I, I really did want to play live. So mm -hmm. once I started to do that and jump on shows, it kind of snowballed from there. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, so that was really the beginning motivation was just being able to play loud noise a lot. So it was like the, the, the overall scene and what was going on was kind of the, what's, what sparked that? Yeah, I think so. Um, there was a lot going on. There's a lot going on. And as I said, in Vancouver and, and yeah. Victoria and Seattle. And so it was, uh, Definitely. yeah. That was that was a motivation for sure. That was a huge, I mean, scene. I think that era of noise, but even like geographically from Canada, the west coast of Canada, that was a really big. You know, there were there were some really important projects that came out of there. I mean, uh, the one everyone knows about is, of course, Sam McKinley, the Rita. He's mm -hmm. kind of like the I don't know, the big dog, I suppose, but tons of other ones, you know, you yeah. taskmaster, um, uh, sick buildings, um, et cetera, et cetera. What, what was the, in like, how, how did that kind of whole vibe, that whole scene influence you once you, once you were active? I mean, what was that like being a part of that? Well, not in terms of like your, your, your beginning, but like, you know, you were active and I, how was it feeding off or, 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 or interacting with these other artists in this, this vibrant scene? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it was great. It's something you can only have perspective on now, but once you're in it, it's just kind of a big crazy storm and, mm -hmm. and, uh, but yeah, I mean, there, there was so much stuff going on, you know, so many different artists and everybody had a very unique perspective and approach to things. So that's, I think the thing that I liked the most was everybody was like so individual, so you mm -hmm. could just come at it and do your own thing. And, uh, 
And yeah, so I was really lucky to just see so many different performers and, and that really sparked, you know, an interest and, and people were really, you know, one of the first shows I played was in Victoria and, uh, Ron, who does the project griefer, he was always Mm -hmm. just, uh, trying to get new people to play. So he was like, if you got any hint that you did noise, he was like, okay, you come, come play the show. And he still does that to this day, you know? So, uh, yeah, I was really lucky to have those kind of opportunities and people around that were very, uh, you know, they push you to do things. And so everybody just kind of pushes each other in that sense. Yeah. Were there a lot of artists from like the U S the like also coming through Vancouver at the time? I think was there much crossover. Yes. And no, cause it was more so the other way I say, I would say because Mm. it was a little bit easier to go down there. Whereas, uh, you know, the border between Canada and the U S is not so easy, you know, sometimes for people, especially even for musicians, if you can get right. denied. And so, and it's, it's crazy, but, uh, you know, it happens. And so, yeah, uh, I would say I was definitely going down to the States more, I think, than people were coming up, but there okay. was, a, there was back and forth. Yes. I was and, under the impression that going from Canada to the U S <laughs> was much easier uh no sorry it was much diff- more difficult because like the u.s has this really like um i guess protectionist attitude and i, I have always kind of heard that going from u.s to canada is pretty relaxed but i mean I've heard, I've heard like people getting locked out for example of of the u.s when once they catch the wind once they catch wind that you might be an artist who might be making you know any money whatsoever that um that yeah. it's, that it can be difficult but but you were able to come through fairly regularly without problems yeah. Yeah. It was difficult. You know, you get your car searched, you go through the whole mm. thing and yeah, but you just learn to deal with it. And, you know, sure. luck, luckily I never got denied, but uh, yeah. definitely had some hassles. Yeah. 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 I remember there was that, um, I guess that, that famous, the Rita performance where he like, I think the skate performance, actually, there was the video, which which became the record, but he had like a, a hanging, um, upside down american flag i think on the electronics table or something like that because i think it was right after getting denied i think that was like okay. a, I don't, maybe i'm totally wrong but i think that was like planned to be performed somewhere in the u.s okay the the skate ledge performance and then then they got kicked out and had to you know cancel and um yeah hung the american flag got that on or whatever but uh but yeah i guess well- the the problem is the ironic thing is when you try and do things above the board and say you have a letter of reference or you're being more official about it it can cause even more problems so sure and sure and then the other side of that is when you're trying to be more relaxed and you're like you know hey i'm not going to make any money like you it's difficult to express to them what you're doing because they think of musicians as oh you're gonna play a big rock show and you're gonna make a bunch of money but you're like look i'm this is a hobby it's not (laughs) my living (laughs) yeah 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 Yeah, it's it's like that with a lot of things i think once you unfortunately once you try to like go legit and just explain your situation um you put yourself at much more risk of of being prohibited for you know not just performing but in just a lot of areas of 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 law and life i guess Um, as i've learned being in germany it's that's how it is over here it's like best to just not involve anyone (laughs) once once you try to like explain what you're doing and like make it legit whatever it's just um you're 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 on the then you're in the radar and you're on the in the crosshairs yeah. So unfortunately, it has to be like that. This episode of White Centipede Noise podcast is brought to you by Cruel Symphonies, intrepid noise from Syracuse, New York. Recent releases include cassettes by Ballerina in Blood, Parasite Nurse, Territorial Gobbing, Afternoon Tea Time, Klein Quartet, Maltreatment, Genophobia, GX Jupiter Larson, White Widow, Dagger, KPG, Za, and Cadaver. Cruel Symphonies thanks you for your support. It is due to the generosity of customers like you that we are able to fulfill our mission of printing J cards that make print shop employees uncomfortable. Um, so you you came from this really vibrant scene, and like you said, there was a, a wide variety of people doing 
different things. Um, mm. There was, in, I mean, the the artists that I really admire fr- and listened to and listened to today, like um, around that time when I when I was getting into noise, was really also like kind of when you guys were really really active there. So I always saw Vancouver as like this kind of beacon for where some of my favorite products were coming from. And, you know, um, I did kind of like in my mind, at least see like a kind of a, a sound or a kind of like a, a, a an aesthetic, but you, like you said, with a lot of different approaches and you in particular have a very, very unique electronic sound. You're, st- I mean, you're still working within this, like, you know, massive cascading, harsh structures that a lot of other artists are and were, but your, your sound is very, very specific. And I, and I, I guess I would wonder, I, I would kind of assume that has something to do with, um, some of the sources you use. you you use the theremin as one of your main sound sources and have for as long as I, um, have been aware of your work. Um, can you tell me a bit about the theremin and how you arrived at the theremin as your, as your sound source? And, you know, is that, is that your, only sound source is that your um yeah so now it's it's mostly my main sound source yes but Mm -hmm. in the beginning i was trying out different things experimenting with you know everything as you do when Mm -hmm. you're starting out with something and in the beginning so i started with mini theremins i got a couple of them and and tried them out and I would play with usually two and I would have one Mm. pitched up, one pitched down and I would switch between them. And then I sort of graduated later on to, you know, a Moog theremin, which uh, just sounds a lot nicer, warmer. Mm. And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it did take take a while. I mean, it took years to kind of develop the specific sound that I wanted, of course. But mm-hmm. uh, I just love the theremin. It's it's such a strange and unique instrument, and you know, I I play it in my way, of course, not yeah. in, you know any certain way. But uh, but I do like to say that's my sound source. You know, it's it's yeah. not if you have the uh, some idea of like wacky theremin sounds you know that's not my thing at all right so sure yeah but uh and also traveling were you sorry go ahead oh i was just gonna say yeah traveling with the uh theremin was was always strange like flying i would have to have it in my checked bag because it's a pretty it can be a little bit delicate you know temperamental Mm -hmm. so You've had different ones, and I think when I saw you in Europe recently, you had a fairly small one that looked like it was like, like came kind of apart. Like, am I am I maybe am I remembering that wrong? But it looked like you had one that kind of screwed together, but could be kind of broken down to a very small kind of compact thing that wouldn't necessarily look like a theremin. Like, it, is that is that mm. true? Yeah, it is. It is a Moog. It it is definitely portable. So you can take off the antenna and -hmm. you can have a base and set it up. So, yeah, it does become much more compact, which is a lot better. Yeah. And it does have a sturdy housing, too. So, yeah, it's at least it's not, you know, totally you can you can bash it around a little bit, you know. Sure. What drew you to that instrument in the first place? So was it the way it's played or was it the sound? It was the sound for sure. I'm a big science fiction fan and the uh, older movie soundtracks with yeah. the eerie theremin that I was always yeah. drawn to that, you know, definitely from a young age. So it was more of that the and I was just curious about it. So Yeah. Yeah. And are you are you into Clara Rockmore? The yeah, of course, of course. Uh, yeah, I mean virtuoso, and and it's amazing. Yeah, what uh, some of the early uh, virtuosos did with it—just amazing music. Have you ever learned to play it that way, or tried to play it that way in like a traditional no. way? No, no, it must I be very mean, hard. Yeah, I'm sure it's 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 very delicate and and precise like it's like an well it was initially created to be like an electronic violin 
So yeah. that's what, you know, Leon Thurman had in mind when he right. made it. Um, but no, I, I don't feel like I need to play it that way or there's so many people that play it very beautifully in that mm-hmm. way. And that's just not my thing. That's not, you yeah. know, I'm not interested in that. Was it hard to, to dial it in and actually get like noisy, noisy sounds out of it? Because like you said, it's, it's a, it's an instrument. I've, I mean, I've messed around with a theremin before, uh, like, you know, doing this and, you know, it's, a, it lends itself very quickly to like wacky sounds, which you've never, you know, I've never heard in any of your work is it's always mm-hmm. been this really dense, like atonal sound. Was that hard to get and hard to figure that out? Did it take you a while? Um, yeah, probably a little bit in the beginning, but again, it's a, approaching it as a sound source. And so I'm using all kinds of effects and I'm looping right. it. You know, I, I have like four loop looper pedals that I work with. And okay. so, yeah, approaching it more as a sound source. And it did take a while to, to figure out how to get the kind of precise sounds that I wanted out of it. Yeah. Do you remember being in Minneapolis? I, you 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 came through Minneapolis on tour, I think, in two thousand seven, with Taskmaster right. and um, Brutophilia, I think. Or um, sorry. oh yes, yes, and Coastal. Yeah. Exactly, and Coastal. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you guys played at a at a at a show that I set up. Uh, oh yes! Oh yes! <laughs> in a DIY oh, yes. space where there were zero people there, it was the first show I ever set up. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, you guys played for me basically, and like that was really fun for me. But I felt bad. Um, but do you do you remember <laughs> what happened there with the with the PA? Because I remember, yeah, uh, <laughs> the sound guy like you know set it and forget it. He he set the the level and like went out for a smoke or something like that. Yeah, and I think he, he lit the speaker on fire. Yeah, he uh, went to the other room to make food while I was playing. <laughs> and yeah, the funny thing, I I do remember that uh, vividly because I was so focused on what I was doing, I didn't notice that the speakers were smoking. And yeah. so when I stopped playing, you know, I I looked up and I saw the room was filled with smoke and it took me a second. I was like, where, where's that smoke from? And then I was like, Oh shit, you could smell the burnt speaker. Yeah. And I kind of went, Oh shit. And then the sound guy comes over and he's just to me like, what the fuck? But he, you know, said right away, I went into the other room to make yeah. food. And so I was like, okay, well I, you know, what am I supposed to say? And so Eric uh, from coastal, you know, he was apologizing, but I was not apologizing because I was like, well, I didn't really do anything wrong, but uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then he called me a bitch and, you know, it was lots of fun. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. He got pretty aggressive about it. I mean, he, yeah, he was pretty upset, but again, he was, he was uh, deflecting. He's a sound guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember getting heated, but I didn't know he was. I didn't know he he, he was that insulting. Um, but I remember, mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, it happens. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't intentionally, <laughs> you know, burn the speakers or anything. It just happened. Oh, of course, yeah. But is that something that's happened uh, on numerous occasions with a the theremin? Because I know that with some electronic sources, like you know, no input feedback, f- uh, for example, with like a. a from a, from a mixer that you can get some really, really low frequencies that aren't even audible, but that can just rip through, mm-hmm. you know, has, have you had that ex- experience more than once? Mm, no, I think that was probably the worst. I, I okay. try and be pretty careful about it. Cause I really like high frequencies too. I like really yeah. low frequencies and really high frequencies. Yeah. And I, yeah, I know that can be pretty punishing, but, uh, yeah, yeah. You just have to try and keep it a little bit balanced with the levels. Yeah. But again, just don't have the person doing sound, you know, leave while they're doing sound right. too. That's yeah. kind of key. Right. Of course. And yeah. I, but you don't use any limiters or anything like that. I, th- I think in some way, a lot of times, uh, distortion pedal is oftentimes like the best 
speaker protector in some way because it's a natural compressor and limiter mm -hmm. you know if even if even if a theremin maybe has some can pump out like a 20 20 hertz frequency or lower usually a uh some other distortion pedal will kind of filter mm -hmm. that i guess but yeah. um yeah i don't know um so you toured a lot actually or a few times at least um did you tour Canada much or was it mostly uh, the US? Yeah, it's mostly US. I'm I'm a trader for sure, but uh <laughs> it just it's just the way it happened, you know, and, and yeah. it was a lot easier to do more dates in the US. Driving across Canada, the cities are so far apart. Right. And, you know, it's it's a lot longer of a journey, so it just yeah. kind of happened that I played a lot more in the states. Yeah. yeah. You've also played in Europe a few times, right? Yeah. You've done two two kind of tours. You've done two tours over in Europe, right? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. What's the most intense thing that's ever happened to you while on tour? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't <laughs> know. Tour, touring is always kind of punishing, but yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah Europe was pretty grueling because... Uh, uh, there's so many just like buses and trains and you're just kind of constantly yeah. mo moving and moving. And yeah. I definitely remember waking up and I didn't know what city I was in. And that was kind of weird. Cause wow. just, you know, just for a brief, like couple of minutes, I was like, Oh shit, where am I? Like what city? Yeah. Am I in? yeah. <laughs> but, uh, that's also with punishing schedules too, you know? Right. You're trying to squeeze as much as you can out of it. Yeah. I think in some ways Europe has a reputation for, on the one hand, being more, in some ways, welcoming for performing artists. Like they at least like, there's more of an expectation I think in Europe that the 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 sh the venue or the the organizer or the promoter kind of at least get some food or something like that. Or yeah, it's not always the case, but it seems like more of a more of a a norm that they'll take care of some basic things like when you show up at the venue there's some food we're in the united states if you're on a low you know depending on what kind of tour you're on um you're that's on not happening you're yeah. on your own that's not happening but at the same yeah. time europe is very small in some way it's very it's very condensed and, and crowded mm. so I, I i've never toured like that but i feel like that would be stressful because you don't really have as much room to just you know you're probably not going with like your own car you're probably going by by bus yeah. and things like that and you don't have the room to just kind of like relax you know people don't really have like big basements to like that's true. crash out in it's usually like yeah. a small, small kind of apartment corner here. yeah <laughs> it's a different yeah. it's a different kind of body feel i think i don't know um yeah that's interesting well in the states is so huge yeah so you have yeah. those road trips in the car are totally different than you yeah. know, being on a train and yeah, in Europe and being cramped. Yeah. Europe is crowded. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not a big fan of crowds too. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit overstimulating, you know? Yeah. But, uh, but it's interesting. It's different, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So intense, intense things that have happened. I'll, I'll, I'll spare you on that one. I'm sure you've, you've had plenty. Uh, yeah, it's more, I mean, more bleak moments. Luckily, I can't think of anything totally horrifying. You know, it, it's more just kind of yeah. depressed, depressing, bleak parts. Yeah. Touring? Yeah, I would say so. Especially in the States. Sometimes you just have those moments where you're like, why? Why am I doing this? Like, why am I doing this to myself? But you know, is that the predominant feeling that you get when touring, or, or is it, or is it mm, more? I more think those the fun and joy. Those are just brief moments, you know. Yeah, yeah when it gets a little too bleak, you're yeah. just kind of like, man, I could just be at home and you know, my warm <laughs> bed. What am I doing? But yeah, that's the. Yeah the gamble of it and the fun i guess too right this episode of white centipede noise podcast is brought to you by flag day recordings established in 2017 flag day recordings is a tape and cd label based out of pennsylvania 
focused on promoting harsh noise, avant-garde, musique concrète, electroacoustic, and ambient styles. Recent CDs include Mariam Sirvan, Peter J. Woods, and Tourette. Flagdayrecordings.bigcartel.com. What about some standout um, shows that you've seen while traveling? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, I mean, I do kind of like festivals, I would say, are great mm -hmm. just because you have, you know, so many different people from all over. So, you know, even like even here at home for me in Vancouver, like the Vancouver Noise Festival has always been great. Victorian Noise Festival. Um, it's a little bit different on the road, but uh, I would say in Europe, I don't know. There's there's so many like different interesting venues, you know, like yeah. in in Prague. There's you know you play on a ship and that's attached to the harbor. I'm totally forgetting the name of that venue at the moment. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's this old. Um, ship and it's attached to the harbor and so you're playing in like the hull of the of the ship um a lot of reverberation sure. and it's yeah. and that was in winter too when we uh played there and it was really cold and it was uh it was heated by this wood stove um and uh yeah i don't know you just you get to see like just weird places in in Italy, we played at this venue that's in the mountains and it was just the most spectacular view. And it was so, um, remote too. And mm -hmm. so I was thinking like, who's going to come to this show, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it was like a good sized crowd showed up like 40 people or something to this cool. art gallery in the mountains. So it was wow. so, so bizarre. Like, I, I don't even know what their journeys there would be like. It was definitely, you know. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah just crazy. There things. are those. There are those sorts of places in Europe. There are also a lot of like kind of cultural centers. It's a weird thing. It's either like really wild DIY spaces mm -hmm. or kind of like bland, like government supported. Right places i guess or you know some sort of more official institutions yeah yeah there is a strange mix uh there's not as I, much of those just diy spots like someone's someone's warehouse or someone's um basement of course you know it's just it's a different you don't yeah. have that as much like you in the u.s Right. But those, those are much harder to keep going, you know, the underground yeah. independent spaces. I mean, it's, yeah, it's really hard. And I think they're disappearing. I mean, before I moved away, like seven, eight years ago, they were already pretty much extinct. Yeah. And at least in Minneapolis. And I think that's kind of the, the, the general trend everywhere. And I'm sure by now, you know, Eight years later, it's really not like it was maybe 15 years ago at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's pretty sad how downhill it's gone. Well, of course, with the pandemic, that's, that's a whole other yeah. stress on it. But before, I mean, spaces were just struggling to, you know, I was, I was in a re rehearsal space that was a warehouse that used to do shows years ago. And I mean, it was around for, I have 15 years for a long time. And yeah. of course that's just shut down now. Um, yeah. Because of development, you know, in the area. Yeah. So, exactly. but yeah, it's just so Vancouver is the same, the same way. Are there, are there still spaces in Vancouver? There are, but they're very much just holding on. I mean, yeah. they keep disappearing by the day, you know, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's really hard. You just don't, there's just no support you know, for yeah. those kind of venues. Yeah, it's sad. I'm, well, and I wonder what the new... I mean, I, I I do think that there's a... With every end of a, an era, there's something that reemerges, a, a new solution to things. So I'm curious what the new... What the new answer will be to yeah. lack of, lack of uh, DIY spaces and how people will, will adapt to that or what will happen. I'm not... I'm, 
I don't know. Um, this episode of White Centipede Noise Podcast is brought to you by Scream and Ride Distro and Absurd Expedition Label. Canadian-based source for experimental electronics, harsh noise, etc. Over 1,500 items in stock on all formats. Media mail shipping to the USA and affordable international shipping. Coming early 2022. Hermit Chick White Split Tape. Two distinct vocal noise approaches from opposite coasts of Canada. Neural Objective Constraint Tape. Unreleased material from 1996. Mott and Violent Shogun. Mangle Tape. Split and Collaborative Tape Works. Andrew Nolan and Misery Engine. Split Tape. Cosmic Industrial Dusty Noise Malaise. The Rita. Her Shell, The Shoot Tape. Sputtering Crunch of Obsessive Minimalism. Alex York, Double Tape. Tape and Synth Works for Melancholy Mood. Visit ScreamAndRide.com and AbsurdExposition.BandCamp.com. Uh, you, you told me in the beginning you were primarily interested in performing live and not so much in recording. Um, has that changed? Has, has more of a focus shifted to, to recording in your... Yeah, yeah, that, year? yeah, definitely. That that was a slow process, but I did over the years get more into recording and get kind of more involved. And you know, instead of just doing kind of one take for you know an album, yeah, mm -hmm. I do I do get a lot more involved. But it it took a while. Yeah, sure. Tell me about revisualizations that tape for. Mm -hmm. Uh, new forces because I've been listening to your recordings for a long time and I have many of them uh, from the earlier days and I've always thought they were great but that was a recording when I heard it I mean maybe it was part of, probably because I, I, I kind of took a break buying stuff and when I moved to Germany I bought it and it came out kind of like shortly after moving to Germany and I got it and I was totally blown away by it and it was a totally new kind of approach and new intensity um, that I hadn't heard in, in earlier recordings. And maybe maybe there were some around the air that came before then that also were of the same ilk, I suppose, that I that maybe I didn't check. But um, this to me was like a huge break. Uh, can you tell me about the, the, about, the, about the recording a bit? And if that has the same uh, importance for you than it does to me? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, I think that was just one of those steps in getting more involved and doing longer recordings and yeah trying out it's very long yeah trying out different kind of sound sources and i it's difficult i i to remember exactly what i used on it even because it it is a while ago but uh yeah i think it was just using a tape echo and just trying out different things really and yeah. and and you know leaving things set up at home and and working on it and you know coming back to it a couple days later just taking more yeah. time you know to me it wasn't even necessarily the sound sources i mean the 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 clarity and the and the power the power of the sounds was one thing but also the way it was kind of composed or the way it was structured was really mm. you know it, it had a, a lot of moments where it builds and builds and builds and then like drops off mm. to like a really quiet part and like loops just a totally i don't know with also very minimal minimal sounds and minimal means but a really really involved like long compositions and mm. really yeah just simply kick ass i was i was really into that and i mean everything i've heard since then also has been of that same caliber and kind of in that same, in that same world sonically. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think that's just, that's just building on and getting a little bit more into editing and, you know, just working sure. a little bit more with that you yeah. know, than before. Do you work like, do you, do you, do you multi-track in a computer? No, I, I'm not, I, I do still keep recordings pretty minimal. Like I mm -hmm. do like to, well, before I'd be, I would do recordings more of what my live work was and, and just kind of working off of that. But now it's like with recordings, it's, I don't, I don't think about it as, okay, I need to be able to perform this 
piece. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's completely that album and that's it. And so Mm -hmm. I don't need to have to reproduce those sounds. So yeah, it's, uh, was that something that kind of maybe limited you when you recorded earlier that, because I actually, now you say that it's kind of how I've worked. I've thought sometimes in the past, like, oh, I can't do this on a recording because it couldn't be done in a live situation. Has that been ever kind of your, the way you think about it? Yeah. Like kind of yeah. Limiting, limiting myself based on what I, you know, think is appropriate and what, or what could be reproduced live. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I just kind of threw that out and, and yeah. was like, okay, this is just, the sounds on the album and that's it. And, and yeah. they're different things for sure. Yeah. I mean, they're different things no matter what, but uh, sure. with your LP base waters, uh, the theme of water is present there and it's present in a lot of your other works. I think it's referenced um, also in your performances that I've seen, the ones that I've seen recently you use, you know, really great backing images of minimal images of water. Um, I, I get the sense that this is a important image for you. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what that symbol means to your work? If that's possible. Yeah, sure. It, well, it tied into Risalka in the beginning. It's this, uh, water spirit mm. and, yeah. uh, of course I live on the West coast by the ocean and I work at, well, working with video of water, it's, it's hypnotic. It's like watching a fire, you know, and, and it's a pattern that's constantly changing. It's just, and yeah, water is a, it's a powerful thing. It's, it's life and it's, it gives life and it takes life and it's really Mm -hmm. part of everything. So it's symbolic, but it's also just visually very interesting too. And you can, yeah. you can uh, just, as I said, it's hypnotic, and and so you can kind of sink into it. Your LP uses also water sounds. Yeah, um, I don't know if that's a sound source that you also then manipulate, or if it's just, um, you know, yeah. intro and outro. I kind of thing. I believe I used both so Mm -hmm. again i'm trying to think but uh yeah i i use the sound sources and manipulate them but then also some raw samples and Mm -hmm. uh you know i've got more into i've got a hydrophone so i got more into you know underwater recordings and things like that too what's that what's a hydrophone uh it can be submerged into water like a microphone yeah but uh but uh yeah, you can put it in water, cool. submerged, so you can get underwater recordings. Um, and have you used that for? Yeah, on for more software? more recent stuff has used uh, more of those recordings. Yeah, yeah. Cool, awesome. When you work with the video, do you ever coordinate yourself with it, or do you just have it play in the background, like? Um, yeah, I, I do use, I did use it as about the length of what I wanted to play. So Mm -hmm. I would have it in mind with like the live piece that I was going to be doing. And then I would also use some specific videos to give myself cues. So when I'm kind of Mm -hmm. towards the end, I would have a certain color come up. And then I would yeah. know, okay, I have this many minutes left before yeah. the, en- the end of the video, you know? Yeah. yeah. I asked because when I saw you play, there was for maybe 10 minutes or so, this really static image of the water as you were building and building and building. And then one moment came where you swiped your hand and made a huge change in the theremin and, and the sound shifted in some way. And then at this exact moment, uh, the screen went red right. and I just kind of assumed that you had somehow, I, th- I thought you had triggered the video somehow, maybe with your electronics or something like that. Right. Um, yeah, but, it's not that advanced, but, but okay. yeah, you were, but you're working with you, you're aware of what's on the video and like, how. yeah, and, 
Yeah, I would, uh, it, it would become kind of a complete package. So I'd be working with the video and the sound and, and have it in mind of, yeah, when, when certain, but you can only be like so much aware of it. So of course, every, right. every show it would kind of change and, and, yeah. you know, evolve. <laughs> Are there noise artists from Vancouver that like spaz out when they play? <laughs> you mean very, very physical? Yeah, or yeah. Because I, you're very, very stoic when you perform. As yeah. is, you know, as is uh, Taskmaster. As is Sam McKinley. I mean, all of the mm -hmm. Vancouver artists that I have seen live play this really intense monolithic sound and they're all but they're all very like studied and and stoic in their in their physical body language mm -hmm. and i've never seen anyone rocking out i'm just curious if oh there are yeah there's yeah? there's okay. for sure people who uh yeah maybe not as many in in vancouver probably more victoria they, they're okay. a little bit crazier there <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's probably just a few people. I don't know. Do you see noise as a study? Do you do you, do you listen deeply? Do you do you, do you, I don't know what my question is exactly, but when you're working with sound, are you are you trying to give something out or are you like sinking into the sound? I don't I don't I don't know. If that makes sense as a question. Uh I uh, sinking in for sure. It's, it's, yeah, it's such a focus for me and it's like a little sanctuary. And at mm. some point I think it becomes a almost out of body experience mm -hmm. and, uh, you just forget yourself and yeah, can become completely dissolved in the sound. Mm. Is it ever anything that's unpleasant to you or is it like a very, or is it a comforting kind of feeling? Mm, I think it's, it could be both. Yeah. It's difficult. I wouldn't say that it comes from a joyous place. It's, it's mm -hmm. more, it's many things, you know, it's yeah. not, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. It can be a release, but it can also be, it, yeah, it could be difficult. It could be painful too. So it's not mm -hmm. always a, it's not really a happy thing, but it's not a negative mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Is there anything in your daily life that inspires you to make noise? Mm. Um, well, I guess everything, I mean, 
but yeah, in the beginning, I would say it was more uh, needing to do it to get, you know, ag- aggression and to get all the the uh, destructive kind of behavior in a more creative place. Um, but I think it's become something a lot more, you know, a lot more balanced now. Mm-hmm. I asked about water um, as one symbol that I've noticed in your work. Are there any other themes or symbols that you kind of follow uh, over a time period with the project that it's, you know, like, um, I mean, I've, I've noticed maybe specific releases have references to certain things, but is, are there any other overarching themes think, that you work with or explore? I think it always changes. It, it is always changing. Yeah. From mm-hmm. record to record, even from show to show, it's always True. something different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and yeah, especially over the years, I mean, things that I was influenced by or, or, themes I was using even five years ago, it's completely different, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, Yeah. it's, it's always evolving and changing. It seemed like there was a period, it seems like you're really active in the past several years, but there was a period where you weren't very active. I don't have this kind of timeline in front of me, but there was this kind of, I guess, heyday 2000, maybe from your start to the early 2010s and then kind of some years where you had a release maybe every couple of years and, and now you're, you've had a lot of releases in the, not a lot, but you've had pretty active amount of releases in the past few years. Was there a reason for that slowdown or that, or that lull specifically? Mm, yeah. I think it just happens. I, I don't like to force things and, and, mm-hmm. you know, life gets in the way too. And, and no. yeah, you just, uh, I take my time with things too. I, I, yeah, I can't just pump albums out. I'm not like that. So it, it just takes the time. Sometimes it's active and you get inspiration or energy and sometimes there's a lull and, and I also just don't beat myself up over that kind of thing anymore. You yeah. know, if, cause you, you can put unnecessary pressure on yourself of, Oh, I need to be doing this, but yeah, I don't do right. that anymore. It has to be natural yeah. Yeah. And flow. This episode of White Centipede Noise Podcast is brought to you by Ominous Recordings, based in Sweden, a harsh noise peddling underdog label since 2005. Available on CD is the complete discography of Knives, a 2005 harsh noise collab between The Cherry Point and Pedestrian Deposits' John Borges. The threesome slitting 7-inch with the 2020 New York City gig. Also, a reissue of one of the best harsh noise albums ever, Black Leather Jesus' Anti, as well as Golden Serenade's Fit, and three of the reader reissues, co-released with phage tapes. Tapes by Foul, Schizophrenic Genius, and split tape between JSH and Compripritor. Visit www.ominousrecordings.com to get your fix. What about your visual artworks? Is that something you've been doing consistently since the beginning of the project? Yeah, but again, I think that's kind of the same thing, is that, yeah, it's up and down. It's when you have time and... There's, there is lulls, but yeah. But I mean, okay. But aside from lulls or, or activity, but can you just tell me in general about your visual artworks, the, the collage works you do and, and, and kind of your approach there? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I've been doing that for a long time before noise. I was doing, mm-hmm. you know, visual art and collage. Yeah. So that's been just a long, long standing passion, you know? And, uh, and noise to me is, is collage as well. So it just Mm -hmm. kind of plays together very well. Yeah. But the, uh, the video was something that developed, you know, later, later on, especially with my sound, uh, Mm -hmm. it's a more kind of recent thing that I've been doing, uh, but it's the same sort of principles, just kind of taking collage and applying it to, to video. You've got this book, which just came out recently. Analog Paper Dreams, Selected Collage Works. Um, can you tell me about 
what's in this book and how that collection came about? Yeah, I wanted to document all of my physical collage pieces. Well, not even all of them. It's it's a good majority of my physical collages. And mm -hmm. so I took the time to photograph everything. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to put it together in a book to have it to have it all. Um, but yeah, it's, I just wanted to share it with people because they're, you know, pieces that aren't for sale and, you know, sure. so I thought book form would be, would be the best way to kind of be able to share that. You have them in your possession that you plan on holding yeah. on to. Yeah. yeah. I, th I think so. Yes. My, yeah. My apartment's filled with it, but, uh, yeah, it's just difficult to, especially, you know, bigger mannequin pieces. I just can't really, yeah. I can't really part with them. Sure. Yeah. But I think that was cool. also a little bit due to having downtime with the pandemic. You know, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know if, if I was busy, you know, doing shows and stuff, if I would have taken the time out to do it. So yeah, it's kind of a weird positive of, you know, sure of if downtime. Yeah, I think there were. I mean, I think it's safe to say there were plenty of weird positives of the downtime. Not that there weren't negatives as well, but I mean, I think that was one thing that people had a chance to kind of work on projects that maybe had been sitting for a long time unjustly because of all the other stuff we have to do. Yeah, yeah. Did you did you publish did you release this book yourself? Yeah, I did. Yeah. It uh it was quite a task, quite an undertaking, but I'm glad no. I'm glad that I did it. Um it kind of came in part by being involved with uh you know, the Death Squad book and uh yeah, that came out that's right. and which was very different, but I kind of thought, hmm, you know, I went with the same local publisher and cool. uh yeah so it was just i was totally blown away by that book and i thought it, yeah, yeah absolutely can, can you tell us about what your role in that book was exactly um i i just helped with the editing i co-edited with uh jason campbell the book mm -hmm. there was just so much material so it was really you know the two of us helping michael to to come over it and put it together. How was that working with something so intimate and extreme, you know, for, for Michael, his work, um, how was that working on his project in maybe a somewhat an objective way with someone that you're also very close to? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was strange, but uh, you just kind of have to step back and and think of it as the reader, and that's how you're kind of looking at it. And and uh, I just kind of helped in whatever ways that I could, you know. Yeah. So if if he wanted to bounce something off or or you know just have very technical editing done, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, I was just happy to do that because it was you know. It was such a amazing kind of document and uh definitely. Yeah. But I mean it's it's all it's all Michael really. It's just you know, it's his voice and everything. Sure, sure. But I mean it's you know, working with a partner can be can go a lot of ways. I'm I'm curious about mm -hmm. it because I work with Basha on a lot of things and right. it's it's great, it's intense, um, but it really is wonderful but i know for some people it could be very difficult yeah yeah it's it's not easy for sure and but i think michael and i are both pretty good about we're very separate in our how we do things creatively and and we try not influence each other we just like let the other person do what they're going to do you know yeah and we're yeah lucky in that I think it's just a natural balance and that we both kind of, you know, can 
stay objective and yeah yeah but but yeah it's it's not easy for sure do you think his work as mk9 or or do you think your relationship with him has uh had an influence on your work as rusalka yeah well i think that's uh inevitable it's kind of unavoidable but uh but again what i mean we've been doing our own projects for so long and they're very separate so it's uh i mean the well the biggest influence i would say was would be video because i really did start doing video because we toured together and Mm -hmm. i knew that video was such a big part of his performances and i thought well you know he's gonna have his own projector and and he takes his own projector to each show so i thought okay well that's an opportunity to to be able to do video so yeah yeah. that's kind of the one of the main things Mm -hmm. i hope you don't mind me asking but um you know you were also with uh nick wainwright of taskmaster Uh, you guys were together for 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 quite a few years and when i met you guys and when i became aware of your work you were both active and and i know you guys were you know together um can you tell me a little bit about nick's relevance to you as an artist yeah i mean we were touring a lot and uh and uh doing a lot of shows yeah in the early days that was uh you know, very much a motivation as well is that, you know, we each had our projects and, uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, touring especially, I think would be the, the kind of key thing is that, you know, mm-hmm. we both kind of pushed each other to get out there a lot more and, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, definitely drove our, our projects, but again, you know, being very separate artists and you know right. doing our own Definitely. thing at the same time yeah yeah i guess one question i have that is maybe a bit annoying but i think it's unfortunately unavoidable um noise being like an overwhelmingly male dominated genre of music you know 99.9 maybe percent of noise artists <laughs> being male um what factor in in general has this played on your journey as an artist in terms of your interaction with the outside world or you know if 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 any i mean i don't i don't want to dig more than you want to talk about it but i mean has that what what role has that played for you yeah um yeah it's difficult to describe i mean early on when i started rusalka it was part of the project was really about the you know pains of womanhood and and that was very Mm -hmm. much either consciously or subconsciously in the project so it had a big impact but then at the same time you know noise was just about getting away from everything and you know Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's changed over the years or there's a lot of, you know, a lot of different people doing noise and right. I, I don't know. There's not really an easy answer to it. It's, you know, I wish we didn't have to talk about it. Right. I mean, I'm sure you, you didn't, you didn't even want to ask the question. Right. So, no, I mean, it's not, I didn't want to ask the question, but I also felt, yeah. It's also not maybe not appropriate to avoid it because maybe it. I, I mean, I guess I didn't really know what your feeling about it is. If it's something that you feel is a like um, an element that you want to have more attention brought to or discussed more, or or, or rather the opposite. Like, do you ever feel expected to make it a, a like a like an a topic in your work or, or speak out on it or, mm. or anything like that? Yeah, it's, well, noise is kind of my sanctuary away from everything, but right. yeah, it's, it's, you know, uh, I don't know. I, I do, I do want to get away from it because, yeah. you know, that's not what it's about for me. And, and I, 
you know, noise is very much a getting, getting away from ego and my identity. So yeah, it's, and you can't, you know, what am I supposed to do about it? I'm out here doing noise and that's really all that I want to do. I don't care if there's, you know, a boys club or anything that's, it's so, yeah. you know, these, I, I can't really do much about it. <laughs> yeah. Is it something that you feel is changing or you feel like, um, has, has any change in the recent years? I hope it's changed. I think it's changed, you yeah. know? Yeah, I hope so. I can, I can see that it's changed a bit more, but you know, it's kind of sad because some things just stay the same. So right. yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Do you feel that your, that your femininity has a fundamental approach to your, or a fundamental influence on your approach to sound? Like, do you, do you think that that is a, something that is reflected in, in your, in your music, not necessarily the, the themes, but in, in the way you craft yeah, sound? I think so. I think, I think more so in the, in the beginning. Yeah. But it, it definitely changed. It definitely changed over time. Um, mm -hmm. I think it, it comes back to subconscious things too, is, you know, we're again, working out the kind of pains and that's unfortunately one of the big pains, you know, about being a woman and, 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 and also just in general, yeah, working out the frustrations and mm -hmm. the anger about things. Yeah. yeah. You've dropped some really great and heavy releases recently, particularly, I mean, you made an LP, which was a really standout record of the past several years in noise. I feel, um, what do you got going on right now? And what's, what are we, what are we going to hear next from you? I will have a record coming out on the label virtues, which is, uh, oh. yeah. That'll be yeah. the next release coming out. Yeah. Um, and I saw something like a blurb somewhere. It, I believe it said you, you, it was listed under your, your, your name, Kate Rissick. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm going to be releasing from now on just under my name. Uh, really? Instead of Rasalka. Yeah. It's just, I have done a few things just under my name and uh i've used the name rasalka for a long time and mm -hmm. i just feel there's no conceptual shift or any difference in the material because rasalka has always been me so mm -hmm. it's just gonna be under my name from now on cool yeah and will that be a uh what format will that be on that will be an, an lp great yeah yeah and i yeah i'll have some other things i'm thinking about doing some self-releases so there might be something in that nature coming up soon do you have a label or have you ever had a label like proper you know no i yeah i i i'm looking to get a little bit more into that but, uh, yeah, I have not had a label before, before. Yeah. Is it the idea that you could be involved in the, I mean, visual aspect of it? Cause from memory, actually, I know that you've done covers for a number of other artists. Um, do you also do your collage work and, and covers for your own releases as frequently? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do really like to be as involved as I can with the, uh, yeah. yeah, the visual aspect. Um, yeah. and more so recently too, like in the, in the beginning I might, you know, have let other people do artwork, but sure. now I'm, I'm definitely a control freak. And I, yeah, I think yeah. that's, that's something that happens in the beginning is yeah. You let people run with it and it's good to, <laughs> when, when, when you get at the spot where you're like, okay, I'm going to make sure I, I mean, I, th I think just in general, it's, it's, it's great to see work from an artist 
where the visual art always also represents their vision, even if they didn't do it themselves. But I, I've less and less, I've grown away from this idea of like the label aesthetic. Um, because to me, that's not really, I, I would rather the, the release be treated like, you know, individually for the artist rather than part of a batch or something like that, where everything kind of looks like the label. And then everyone, you know, I feel like that does a, that's only half of the artist in some ways. So I think that's, mm -hmm. that's an important thing to take over at some point as an artist. I mean, I guess some people are happy just to like, you know, have the music come out and they're not too concerned, but that's, I think that's a, that's a pretty key thing, I think. Yeah, I can understand either way. It's it's so individual, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just for me, I just I like the the package. I like to for sure yeah, be more involved now. Yeah. Now available from White Centipede Noise, Altar of Flies, Otterblick Triple LP. There has always been chafing and harsh elements in Altar of Flies, but never before has he put that particular ingredient in focus like this. Electronics burnt to crisp crackling meat slab fizz, and reckless physical wreckage. All this paired with his signature vintage apparatus and magnetic tape wizardry. And the result is an elegantly churned up pigsty. That is an excerpt from the extensive liner notes written by Eric Neustrand. Available at whitesemminoise.com, Bandcamp, and soon, a distro near you. Can you tell me your top five noise releases of all time? <laughs> are those are those audio cassettes behind you? I I can't tell if the, yeah. the I can't tell if the, ca the your camera's a bit like like fisheye I think yeah, so I no. I couldn't tell if they're like VHS because they look they look kind of big but I, but they're cassettes and are those are, those are so okay. yeah okay yeah they cool. are they are tapes uh yeah. that's a good question I mean well if we're talking noise noise i'd say you know probably ccc phantasmagoria or mm -hmm. anything by them really um mm -hmm. and controlled bleeding knees and bones mm -hmm. um hmm. i this is more experimental but zoviet france's monomishi is an mm -hmm. album that i love Cool. Yeah, yeah, I don't. I mean, there's no need to, like, not include things because they're not pure yeah, noise. And I think just in general, noise. anything, anything kind of in the noise experimental industrial realm. Mm -hmm. So Soviet France, which which album did um, you say? Monomishi is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I love that album, and uh, uh, well, I'd have to put Pedestrian Deposit in there, probably mm -hmm. Volatile. Mm -hmm. like that album a lot and uh what are we at now that's four uh and angelis uh eurogene that's a great i don't know what that i don't know what yeah. that is uh angelis is a french french oh and and and, 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 and yes, angelis right. okay i, I was it. i was and. i was thinking <laughs> and i i okay i read that as angelis but that's wrong um but oh. okay yeah yeah I, yeah. I understand. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. But there's, uh, uh, I connected a little bit more with industrial albums early on. So, you mm -hmm. know, it's more things like coil, you know, music to mm -hmm. play in the dark too. And uh, mm -hmm. I mean, even like house or off, you know, mm -hmm. things like that were, uh, yeah, I, I really liked those albums uh, early on. And sure. They're, they're yeah. still kind of my top albums, too. Yeah. Was that like before you started Rusalka? Or was that kind of around the same time you were starting Rusalka? Yeah, a little bit before Rusalka was, you know, getting into that's getting into Coil and, yeah. you know, Einster's Ending Neubauten and things like that, yeah. that kind of take you down the rabbit hole, you know. For sure. Yeah. Um, I didn't ask you originally, but did you have any musical uh, projects or bands uh, before Rusalka? Noise no. or otherwise? Uh, no. I, I 
played around with sound and I wasn't quite sure, you know, I knew that I wanted to do electronic sound. I just didn't really know in what form. So it took me Mm -hmm. a little bit of playing around with things to figure out what exactly, you know, I wanted to do. Sure. Yeah. And my next question is, um, can you give me five noise releases of the past year or so that you've been into really in, impressed by interested in favorites um hmm. i mean i don't know about specific releases but i would say it can be artists so. yeah i would or, say things like you know i'm really impressed with him occult that's you mm-hmm. know such a great project it's yep. really cool to see you know more projects like that and uh mm-hmm. you know mass marriage has been doing some great uh releases yep, lately definitely. like really honing, honing you know her sound and for sure and uh yeah I'd, I'd say those are my top mentions but uh okay. yeah cool. I, new mass marriage album is excellent on yeah. new forces that's yeah. a high recommendation for sure. for sure all right well kate um is there anything else you'd like to add? Is there anything else you'd like to make note of that um, I missed or got wrong or anything you'd like to <laughs> to tell your fans out there, people listening? Uh, I think that's it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm excited about uh, the release on the Virtues label. So that's yeah. almost the next thing. And, and Do you know when roughly that's going to... Um, we'll see. It'll you know, hopefully be early this year. So it's yeah. like submitted and at the plant and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. There's some slowdowns because sure. of supply issues, but yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. That's exciting. Actually. That's super exciting. I didn't, I, 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 I forgot about that. Actually. I saw that like maybe, you know, you scroll on the internet half asleep sometimes and, you know, I, I saw that upcoming on Virtues, Alex Kmet's label, and I, I saw your name, and I thought, what? like, I was blown away. And, and an LP, yeah, and an LP, and it was. I mean, that's very exciting to know that it's, um, that it's that it's happening, and uh, that it's you know a continuation of of your work that I'm such a big fan of. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me and and everyone out there and um we'll keep in touch and talk to you later awesome take care thanks bye bye (laughs) thanks again for tuning into white sampy noise podcast head over to the patreon for more including private episodes of noise on the run exclusive photos video and audio related to the show and discounts at the white sampy noise mail order your support is extremely appreciated and vital to keep the show going